and be the first person this evening to endorse the declaration. President of the Media Council of Tanzania, represented by Senior Council Mark Boman, and I know many of you like to call my brother-in-law Judge Mark Boman. I always find it rather bizarre because he sat, I think, as a judge of one particular session um, to which was more of an ethical kind of a thing, you know. I think it was set on a judge motivator or something. Um, so I'd rather recognize him as a senior counsel rather than uh, uh, my, my, my. And, and maybe from now on uh, the media would like really to recognize Mark Bumani as senior counsel rather than judge Mark Bumani. <laughs> Members of the governing board of the Media Council of Tanzania, the executive secretary of the Media Council, Mr. Kajubi Mukanyanga, Members of the MCT Think Tank on Freedom of Expression and Media Issues, representatives of the diplomatic missions, I don't seem to recognize the face uh, of any particular ambassador, so I stand to be corrected. Members of the media fraternity, invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, May I at the outset thank the leadership of the Media Council of Tanzania for this invitation to participate at a very historic and event of historic proportion and of significant importance in the process of what Professor Anthony Giddens would describe as the process of democratizing democracy. I am humbled by this honor and recognition. The launch of the Daslam Declaration on Editorial Freedom, Independence and Responsibility, abbreviated the field, to be later followed this evening by voluntary endorsement of the declaration, attests to the growing attention being paid to the need to transform social, economic, and political power relations in our society. I wish to avail this opportunity to commend the Media Council of Tanzania and more specifically its state tank on freedom of expression and media issues under the leadership of my very dear friend Professor Isashiji for this very outstanding declaration. Chairperson, the liberal American social scientist Arthur M. Schlesinger, Jr., who was President uh, John F. Kennedy's speechwriter, wrote in his book, The Cycles of American History, that democracy is not self-executing. In other words, every society that pursues democratic ideals and values needs courageous individuals who can intervene in a variety of ways and forms and means to execute democracy, to make democracy work, and to let a hundred flowers to bloom. One powerful source and driver of such intervention is the power of the spoken and the written word that allows the people to voice their conscience. In this vein, the right to access of information, the right to free expression and opinions, and the right to freedom of speech stand out above all other human liberties. Indeed, the English poet John Milton 
put it in his 1644 protest think piece against licensing of printing and censorship titled Thinking Greek, Aeropagitica. He wrote, Give me the liberty to know, to utter, and to argue freely according to conscience above all liberty. But it was the Nobel laureate Amartya Sen who probably has offered a deep, deeper meaning to these fundamental rights. In his magisterial book, Development as Freedom, he has argued that the general enhancement of political and civil freedoms is central to the process of development itself. The relevant freedoms include the liberty of acting as citizens who matter and whose voices count rather than living as well-fed, well-clothed, and well-entertained vassals. So my friends, we know well that for the people to be able to voice their conscience, they need a free and independent media. The media is the conduit for the people to exercise their fundamental right to information and to free expression. And once the rights and opinions of the people in a democracy can also be secured through different modes including public debates, demonstrations and protests, often it is the media that captures and channels all these rights into the broad public domain, thereby contributing to their wide dissemination, interrogation and it logically follows that where the media is the principal source and purveyor of freedom of information and the platform for enabling freedom of speech to thrive fails to act as a free and independent press or media, the people inevitably get betrayed. Their power as citizens who matter gets quashed. Indeed, it is a situation that can beg the question why the media should, after all, claim to be the promoter and the guardian of freedom of inf information and expression when, on the contrary, it acts as an instrument for curtailing, suppressing, distorting, and even subverting that very freedom of information and expression. As Amartya Sen quizzed in an article for the World Association of Newspapers during the World Press Freedom Day in May last year, May the 3rd last year, the ine inevitable question arises, quote, what's the point of press freedom? Close quote. Professor Sen was questioning how press freedom could enrich human lives, enhance public justice, and even promote economic and social development in response to the politics of censorship where censorship diminishes people's lives, reduces knowledge, stifles humanity, and maims human ability to learn from each other. The assumption here is that Sen was making specific reference to state control of the media. Unfortunately, censorship is no longer a George Orwellian concept about Big Brother is watching you. It has also now entered the realm of the private media, where media owners are increasingly becoming more powerful than governments in determining what freedom of information should embody and how freedom of expression and thought should also be treated and disseminated. Indeed, there is a worrisome trend that media owners are increasingly able to control the very functioning of democracy. We here are witnesses to these trends going 
by the recent election experiences in the EAC region. Oddly but true, there is a strong view emerging that in several respects, what we conveniently hail as the fourth estate is turning into a fifth column of democracy, notably in the form of its collusion with state authority, but also extending to other forms of collusion and conspiracies with not-for-people interests in the corporate and the politically controlled and influenced civil society. These collusions mold public opinion through deception and subversion of the truth through what Noam Chomsky describes as the process of manufacturing consent of the people. My friends, it is in this type of environment that the large question, how do you free the media, has become a matter of critical importance in making democracy effective. It is clear that the media can only be freed if the whole idea and philosophy about media independence, freedom, and responsibility is ideologically clarified by delinking it from the dominant conventional connection with state control. Of course, state control of the media, including of its own state-owned media, remains a serious challenge because dissent is yet to be celebrated as a positive seed for promoting deeper democratic productivity in Tanzania. The larger question, however, is whether there could be a free and independent press or free media where editors and media professionals lack real independence and freedom to undertake their responsibilities professionally and ethically in an environment where they are judged on the basis of public trust. The Daslam Declaration on Editorial Freedom, Independence and Responsibility is, I believe, therefore informed by this quest to free the media so that it plays its rightful role both as a vehicle for fair, honest and accurate reporting but also as a platform that assures broad and unlimited access for the widest repertoire of opinion and expression. No one questions, or indeed should question, that in as much as the private media can only survive where it operates as a commercial business and thus the pursuit of the profit motive could not be diminished, the principal role of the media, any media, irrespective of form of ownership, must remain that of a public good. Such role is of particular significance for countries such as Tanzania that are still in a state of nascent democracy and which seek to build a democratic systems that avoid the corruption of money and media power in advancing political control and uncompetitive business behavior. However, and without appearing to be a devil's advocate, I am apprehensive that the declaration we are launching today may receive mixed reactions, particularly from leading media owners, largely because of its radical and revolutionary content. But as in any radical change process, forces of reaction and opposition always tend to emerge. This is more so in our kind of economic and political polity where the very idea of the separation of media ownership and editorship or professional management of the media business goes to the heart of control and influence of national political discourse, direction and the exploitation of the spoils of such influence. Notwithstanding the possibility of such mixed reactions, it is crucial to recognize that what underlies the Dar es Declaration is the basic ethos that societal change and people's rights are won by struggle. They do not fall 
down like manna from heaven. That the struggle to free the media in Tanzania should be vigorously and vigilantly pursued and defended. Editorial tyranny by media owners can be as bad as censorship by the state. In simple terms, money should not be allowed to be speech. In the same way that we admonish seeing money being allowed to be votes in our so-called democratic elections. <laughs> Having said this, let me put a caveat, I know you're clapping, by clarifying that I'm not in any way suggesting that achieving an ideal freedom of expression is easy, or that Tanzania has reached the stage of a mature democratic culture in which media owners are able to fully free themselves from the social, economic, and political distortions that pervade our national environment. Chairperson, at this juncture, allow me also to raise the question relating to the need to distinguish the overarching guiding editorial principles, responsibilities, and obligations that are enunciated in the Dar Islam Declaration from the specific corporate editorial values and guidelines, just as much as in the national political party system, each political party is able to formulate its own values, ideologies, and manifestos. I'm raising this point because once there are basic and fundamental values and principles that underlie the role of the media in a democratic society, the independence of a particular corporate media could be influenced by a number of non-generic factors. Thus, what is public interest may very well be ideologically conditioned, treated differently by different media vehicles. Diversity of opinion on different national issues can consequently be wrongly judged on the premises of ethics, impartiality, and even integrity. In this context, the declaration should have been more categorical in demanding that corporate media publish their editorial values and guidelines. Chairperson, let me conclude by a clear assertion that what the Dar Islam Declaration aims at is to destabilize the existing media order because that is inevitable. The world, after all, is fast experiencing a new mindscape, a new world, mindscape, in promoting the interests of the broad masses. The rise of Wikileaks, bloggers like Michusi, alternative media and social media or what is called Web 2.0 and the role of some of them have recently played in the Tunisian and Egyptian revolutions is a clear manifestation of the new reality that the influence and control of social and political change is no longer the monopoly of the state and the private mainstream media. The question of editorial freedom and independence cannot therefore be oblivious of such realities. The writing is very much on the wall. If the mainstream media will not take serious notice of these new freedoms of information media realities, they will sooner than later damage their relevance. In fact, I view what the Dar Islam Declaration is putting forward in terms of guiding principles, responsibilities, and obligations as timely responses to these new media dynamics and attempting to transform the mainstream media to fit changing social and political circumstances. The Convention of Free and Independent Press or Media is not inherently the fourth estate as we now increasingly observe from the entry of social media. It can only earn such a role if and when it employs editorial freedom and independence 
that effectively transforms citizens from being largely consumers of manufactured perspectives intended to meet the needs of media owners and their cohorts. Chairperson, earlier in this statement I alluded to the radical and revolutionary character of this declaration and that some of us may not feel comfortable to append our signatures in endorsement. Allow me to say something about this because it also it is also a matter that goes to the root of freedom of expression. I cannot do better justice than to cite Professor Noam Chomsky, who in justifying why he signed a petition in defense of the French academic Robert Forison's work on freedom of speech and expression, posited as follows, and I quote, Among the people who have learned something from the 18th century, bracket say Voltaire, it is a truism, hardly deserving discussion, that the defense of the right of free expression is not restricted to ideas one approves of. And that it is precisely in the case of ideas found most offensive that these rights must be most vigorously defended. Advocacy of the right to express ideas that are generally approved is quite obviously a matter of no significance. I endorse Chomsky's logic and I call upon all media owners and other parties that constitute key stakeholders of the Dar es Salaam Declaration to sign this declaration and enforce its principles. Personally, I am very comfortable in signing this declaration. Chairperson <laughs> and my dear friends, once again, my profound thanks to the Media Council of Tanzania for associating me with this important event in Tanzania's media history. You deserve everybody's recognition and appreciation for this landmark work which will significantly contribute to transforming the democratic landscape in our beloved country. Thank you and God bless you. guest of honor is signing the declaration and so it is now officially a, a document that can go out there and I hope that everybody in this room will also endorse it uh, after our guest of honor has signed this very important document. Now that we begin, 
and that means it's official. At this juncture, uh, I would like to very much uh, thank our guest of honor for the thoughts uh, that he gave us regarding press freedom. Cheche and Barzo Alizitoapa, I'm sure they're going to be a subject of discussion even during the cocktail. Uh, and also talking about really the, the new influence, the new media mi mindscape.